Chapter Thirty of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirty. Lord Morven. The winter came at last in good earnest. First black frost, then white snow then sleet and wind and rain, then snow again which fell steady and calm and lay thick. After that came hard frost, and brought plenty of skating, and to Davy the delight of teaching his master. Donal had many falls, but was soon, partly in virtue of those same falls, a very decent skater. Davy claimed all the merit of his successful training, and when his master did anything particularly well, would remark with pride that he had taught him. But the good thing in it for Davy was that he noted the immediate faith with which Donal did or tried to do what he told him. This reacted in opening his mind to the beauty and dignity of obedience, and went a long way towards revealing the low moral condition of the man who seeks freedom through a refusal to act at the will of another. He who does so will come by degrees to have no will of his own, and act only from impulse, which may be the will of a devil. So Donal and Davy grew together into one heart of friendship. Donal never longed for his hours with Davy to pass, and Davy was never so happy as when with Donal. The one was gently leading the other into the paths of liberty. Nothing but the teaching of him who made the human soul can make that soul free, but it is in great measure through those who have already learned that he teaches. And Davy was an apt pupil, promising to need less of the discipline of failure and pain that he was strong to believe and ready to obey. But Donal was not all the day with Davy, and latterly had begun to feel a little anxious about the time the boy spent away from him, partly with his brother, partly with the people about the stable, and partly with his father, who evidently found the presence of his younger son less irksome to him than that of any other person, and saw more of him than of Forgue. The amount of loneliness the Earl could endure was amazing. But after what he had seen and heard, Donal was most anxious concerning his time with his father, only he felt it a delicate thing to ask him about it. At length, however, Davy himself opened up the matter. "'Mr. Grant,' he said one day, "'I wish you could hear the grand fairy stories my papa tells.' "'I wish I might,' answered Donal. "'I will ask him to let you come in here. I have told him you can make fairy tales, too, only he has quite another way of doing it. And I must confess,' added Davy a little pompously, I do not follow him so easily as you. Besides, he added, I never can find anything in what you call the cupboard behind the curtain of the story. I wonder sometimes if his stories have any cupboard. I will ask him today to let you come. I think that would hardly do, said Donal. Your father likes to tell his boy fairy tales, but he might not care to tell them to a man. You must remember, too, that though I have been in the house what you think a long time, your father has seen very little of me and might feel me in the way. Invalids do not generally enjoy the company of strangers. You had better not ask him. But I have often told him how good you are, Mr. Grant, and how you can't bear anything that is not right, and I am sure he must like you. I don't mean so well as I do, because you haven't to teach him anything, and nobody can love anybody so well as the one he teaches to be good. Still, I think you had better leave it alone, lest he should not like your asking him. I should be sorry to have you disappointed." I do not mind that so much as I used. If you do not tell me I am not to do it, I think I will venture. Donal said no more. He did not feel at liberty, from his own feeling merely, to check the boy. The thing was not wrong, and something might be intended to come out of it. He shrank from the least ruling of events, believing man's only call to action is duty. So he left Davy to do as he pleased. Does your father often tell you a fairy tale? he asked. Not every day, sir. What time does he tell them? Generally when I go to him after tea. Do you go any time you like? Yes, but he does not always let me stay. Sometimes he talks about Mama, I think, but only coming into the fairy tale. He has told me one in the middle of the day. I think he would if I woke him up in the night, but that would not do, for he has terrible headaches. Perhaps that is what sometimes makes his stories so terrible I have to beg him to stop. And does he stop? Well... No, I don't think he ever does. When a story is once begun, I suppose it ought to be finished. So the matter rested for the time. 
but about a week after, Donal received one morning through the butler an invitation to dine with the earl, and concluded it was due to Davy, whom he therefore expected to find with his father. He put on his best clothes, and followed Simmons up the grand staircase. The great rooms of the castle were on the first floor, but he passed the entrance to them, following his guide up and up to the second floor, where the earl had his own apartment. Here he was shown into a small room, richly furnished after a somberly ornate fashion, the drapery and coverings much faded, worn even to shabbiness. It had been, for a century or so, the private sitting-room of the lady of the castle, but was now used by the earl, perhaps in memory of his wife. Here he received his sons, and now Donal, but never any whom business or politeness compelled him to see. There was no one in the room when Donal entered, but after about ten minutes a door opened at the further end, and Lord Morven, appearing from his bedroom, shook hands with him with some faint show of kindness. Almost the same moment the butler entered from a third door, and said dinner waited. The earl walked on, and Donal followed. This room also was a small one. The meal was laid on a little round table. There were but two covers, and Simmons alone was in waiting. While they ate and drank, which his lordship did sparingly, not a word was spoken. Donal would have found it embarrassing had he not been prepared for the peculiar. His lordship took no notice of his guest, leaving him to the care of the butler. He looked very white and worn. Donal thought a good deal worse than when he saw him first. His cheeks were more sunken, his hair more grey, and his eyes more weary, with a consuming fire in them that had no longer much fuel and was burning remnants. He stooped over his plate as if to hide the operation of eating, and drank his wine with a trembling hand. Every movement indicated indifference to both his food and his drink. At length the more solid part of the meal was removed, and they were left alone, fruit upon the table, and two wine decanters. From one of them the earl helped himself, then passed it to Donal, saying, "'You are very good to my little Davy, Mr. Grant. He is full of your kindness to him. There is nobody like you.' "'A little goes a long way with Davy, my lord,' answered Donal. "'Then much must go a longer way,' said the earl. There was nothing remarkable in the words, yet he spoke them with the difficulty a man accustomed to speak and to weigh his words might find in clothing a new thought to his satisfaction." The effort seemed to have tried him, and he took a sip of wine. This, however, he did after every briefest sentence he uttered. A sip only he took, nothing like a mouthful. Donal told him that Davy, of all the boys he had known, was far the quickest, and that just because he was morally the most teachable. "'You greatly gratify me, Mr. Grant,' said the Earl. "'I have long wished just such a man as you for Davy. If only I had known you when Forgue was preparing for college.' "'I must have been at that time only at college myself, my lord.' "'True, true. "'But for Davy, it is a privilege to teach him.' "'If only it might last a while,' returned the earl. "'But of course you have the church in your eye.' "'My lord, I have not.' "'What?' cried his lordship, almost eagerly. "'You intend giving your life to teaching?' "'My lord,' returned Donal, "'I never trouble myself about my life. "'Why should we burden the mule of the present "'with the camel-load of the future?' I take what comes, what is sent me, that is. You are right, Mr. Grant. If I were in your position, I should think just as you do. But, alas, I have never had any choice. Perhaps your lordship has not chosen to choose, Donal was on the point of saying, but bethought himself in time not to hazard the remark. If I were a rich man, Mr. Grant, the earl continued, I would secure your services for a time indefinite. But, as everyone knows, not an acre of the property belongs to me, or goes with the title. Davy, dear boy, will have nothing but a thousand or two. The marriage I have in view for Lord Forgue will arrange a future for him. I hope there will be some love in the marriage, said Donal uneasily, with a vague thought of Eppy. I had no intention, returned his lordship with cold politeness, of troubling you concerning Lord Forgue. I beg your pardon, my lord, said Donal. Davy, poor boy, he is my anxiety, resumed the earl, in his former condescendingly friendly, half-sleepy tone. What to do with him I have not yet succeeded in determining. If the Church of Scotland were Episcopal now, we might put him into that. He would be an honour to it. But as it has no dignities to confer, it is not the place for one of his birth and social position. 
a few shabby hundreds a year, and the associations he would necessarily be thrown into. However honorable the profession in itself, he added, with a bow to Donal, apparently unable to get it out of his head that he had an embryo clergyman before him. "'Davy is not quite a man yet,' said Donal, "'and by the time he begins to think of a profession he will, I trust, be fit to make a choice. The boy has a great deal of common sense. If your lordship will pardon me, I cannot help thinking there is no need to trouble about him.' "'It is very well for one in your position to think in that way, Mr. Grant. Men like you are free to choose. You may make your bread as you please.' but men in our position are greatly limited in their choice. The paths open to them are few. Tradition oppresses us. We are slaves to the dead and buried. I could well wish I had been born in your humbler, but in truth less contracted, sphere. Certain roles are not open to you, to be sure, but your life in the open air, following your sheep, and dreaming all things beautiful and grand in the world beyond you is entrancing. It is the life to make a poet." or a king, thought Donal, but the earl would have made a discontented shepherd. The man who is not content where he is would never have been content somewhere else, though he might have complained less. "'Take another glass of wine, Mr. Grant,' said his lordship, filling his own from the other decanter. "'Try this. I believe you will like it better.' "'In truth, my lord,' answered Donal, "'I have drunk so little wine that I do not know one sort from another. You know whiskey better, I dare say.' "'Would you like some now? Touch the bell behind you.' "'No, thank you, my lord. I know as little about whisky. My mother would never let us even taste it, and I have never tasted it. A new taste is a gain to the being. I suspect, however, a new appetite can only be a loss.' As he said this, Donal half-mechanically filled a glass from the decanter his host had pushed towards him. "'I should like you, though,' resumed his lordship, after a short pause, to keep your eyes open to the fact that Davy must do something for himself. You would then be able to let me know by and by what you think him fit for. I will with pleasure, my lord. Tastes may not be infallible guides to what is fit for us, but they may lead us to the knowledge of what we are fit for. Extremely well said, returned the earl. I do not think he understood in the least what Donal meant. Shall I try how he takes to trigonometry? He might care to learn land surveying. "'Gentlemen now, not unfrequently, take charge of the properties of their more favoured relatives. "'There is Mr. Graham, your own factor, my lord. "'A relative, I understand.' "'A distant one,' answered his lordship, with marked coldness. "'The degree of relationship hardly to be counted. "'In the lowlands, my lord, you do not care to count kin as we do in the highlands. "'My heart warms to the word kinsman. "'You have not found kinship so awkward as I, possibly,' said his lordship, with a watery smile." The man in humble position may allow the claim of kin to any extent. He has nothing, therefore nothing can be taken from him. But the man who has would be the poorest of the clan if he gave to every needy relation. "'I never knew the man so poor,' answered Donal, "'that he had nothing to give. But the things of the poor are hardly to the purpose of the predatory relative.' "'Predatory relative! A good phrase!' said his lordship with a sleepy laugh, though his eyes were wide open." His lips did not seem to care to move, yet he looked pleased. "'To tell you the truth,' he began again, "'at one period of my history I gave and gave till I was tired of giving. Ingratitude was the sole return. At one period I had large possessions, larger than I like to think of now. If I had the tenth part of what I have given away, I should not be uneasy concerning Davy.' "'There is no fear of Davy, my lord, so long as he is brought up with the idea that he must work for his bread.' His lordship made no answer, and his look reminded Donal of that he wore when he came to his chamber. A moment, and he rose and began to pace the room. An indescribable suggestion of an invisible yet luminous cloud hovered about his forehead and eyes, which latter, if not fixed on very vacancy, seemed to have got somewhere near it. At the fourth or fifth turn he opened the door by which he had entered, continuing a remark he had begun to Donal of which, although he heard every word, and seemed on the point of understanding something, he had not caught the sense when his lordship disappeared, still talking. Donal thought it therefore his part to follow him, and found himself in his lordship's bedroom. But out of this his lordship had already gone, through an opposite door, and Donal still following entered an old picture gallery, of which he had heard Davy speak, but which the earl kept private for his exercise indoors. 
It was a long, narrow place, hardly more than a wide corridor, and appeared nowhere to afford distance enough for seeing a picture. But Donal could ill judge, for the sole light in the place came from the fires and candles in the rooms whose doors they had left open behind them, with just a faint glimmer from the vapor-buried moon, sufficing to show the outline of window after window, and revealing something of the great length of the gallery. By the time Donal overtook the earl, he was some distance down, holding straight on into the long dusk, and still talking. "'This is my favorite promenade,' he said, as if brought to himself by the sound of Donal's overtaking steps. "'After dinner always, Mr. Grant, wet weather or dry, still or stormy, I walk here. What do I care for the weather? It will be time when I am old to consult the barometer.' Donal wondered a little. There seemed no great hardihood in the worst of weather to go pacing a picture gallery, where the fiercest storm that ever blew could send in only little threads of air through the chinks of windows and doors. "'Yes,' his lordship went on, "'I taught myself hardship in my boyhood, and I reap the fruits of it in my prime. Come up here. I will show you a prospect unequaled.' He stopped in front of a large picture, and began to talk as if expatiating on the points of a landscape outspread before him. His remarks belonged to something magnificent, but whether they were applicable to the picture, Donal could not tell. There was light enough only to give a faint gleam to its gilded frame. "'Reach beyond reach,' said his lordship. "'Endless. Infinite. How would not poor Maldon, with his ever-fresh ambition after the unattainable, have gloated on such a scene? In nature alone you front success. She does what she means. She alone does what she means.' "'If,' said Donal, more for the sake of confirming the earl's impression that he had a listener, than from any idea that he would listen. If you mean the object of nature is to present us with perfection, I cannot allow she does what she intends. You rarely see her produce anything she would herself call perfect. But if her object be to make us behold perfection with the inner eye, this object she certainly does gain, and that just by stopping short of— He did not finish the sentence. A sudden change was upon him, absorbing him so that he did not even try to account for it. Something seemed to give way in his head, as if a bubble burst in his brain, and from that moment whatever the earl said, and whatever arose in his own mind, seemed to have outward existence as well. He heard and knew the voice of his host, but seemed also in some inexplicable way, which at the time occasioned him no surprise, to see the things which had their origin in the brain of the earl. Whether he went in very deed out with him into the night, he did not know. He felt as if he had gone, and thought he had not. But when he woke the next morning in his bed at the top of the tower, which he had no recollection of climbing, he was as weary as if he had been walking the night through. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of Donal Grant》this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 31 Bewilderment. His first thought was of a long and delightful journey he had made on horseback with the Earl, through scenes of entrancing interest and variety with the present result of a strange weariness, almost misery. What had befallen him? Was the thing a fact or a fancy? If a fancy, how was he so weary? If a fact, how could it have been? Had he in any way been the Earl's companion through such a long night as it seemed? Could they have visited all the places whose remembrance lingered in his brain? He was so confused, so bewildered, so haunted with a shadowy uneasiness, almost like remorse, that he even dreaded the discovery of the cause of it all. Might a man so lose hold of himself as to be no more certain he had ever possessed or could ever possess himself again? He bethought himself at last that he might perhaps have taken more wine than his head could stand. Yet he remembered leaving his glass unemptied to follow the earl, and it was some time after that before the change came. Could it have been drunkenness? Had it been slowly coming without his knowing it? 
he could hardly believe it. But whatever it was, it had left him unhappy, almost ashamed. What would the Earl think of him? He must have concluded him unfit any longer to keep charge of his son. For his own part he did not feel he was to blame, but rather that an accident had befallen him. Whence, then, this sense of something akin to shame? Why should he be ashamed of anything coming upon him from without? Of that shame he had to be ashamed, as of a lack of faith in God. Would God leave his creature who trusted in him at the mercy of a chance, of a glass of wine taken in ignorance? There was a thing to be ashamed of, and with good cause. He got up, found to his dismay that it was almost ten o'clock, his hour for rising in winter being six, dressed in haste, and went down, wondering that Davy had not come to see after him. In the schoolroom, he found him waiting for him. The boy sprang up, and darted to meet him. "'I hope you are better, Mr. Grant,' he said. "'I am so glad you were able to be down.' "'I am quite well,' answered Donal. "'I can't think what made me sleep so long. Why didn't you come and wake me, Davy, my boy?' "'Because Simmons told me you were ill, and I must not disturb you if you were ever so late in coming down.' "'I hardly deserve any breakfast,' said Donal, turning to the table. "'But if you will stand by me and read while I take my coffee, "'we shall save a little time so.' "'Yes, sir. But your coffee must be quite cold. "'I will ring. No, no, I must not waste any more time. "'A man who cannot drink cold coffee ought to come down while it is hot.' "'Forgu won't drink cold coffee,' said Davy. "'I don't see why you should. "'Because I prefer to do with my coffee as I please. "'I will not have hot coffee for my master.' I won't have it anything to me what humor the coffee may be in. I will be Donal Grant, whether the coffee be cold or hot. A bit of practical philosophy for you, Davy. I think I understand you, sir. You would not have a man make a fuss about a trifle. Not about a real trifle. The correlative of a trifle, Davy, is a smile. But I would take heed whether the thing that is called a trifle be really a trifle. Besides, there may be a point in a trifle that is the egg of an ought. It is a trifle whether this or that is nice. It is a point that I should not care. With us Highlanders, it is a point of breeding not to mind what sort of dinner we have, but to eat as heartily of bread and cheese as of roast beef. At least so my father and mother used to teach me, though I fear that refinement of good manners is going out of fashion, even with Highlanders. It is good manners, rejoined Davy with decision, and more than good manners. I should count it grand not to care what kind of dinner I had but I am afraid it is more than I shall ever come to. You will never come to it by trying because you think it grand. Only mind, I did not say we were not to enjoy our roast beef more than our bread and cheese. That would be not to discriminate where there is a difference. If bread and cheese were just as good to us as roast beef, there would be no victory in our contentment. I see, said Davy. Wouldn't it be well, he asked, after a moment's pause, to put oneself in training, Mr. Grant, to do without things? or at least to be able to do without them? It is much better to do the lessons set you by one who knows how to teach than to pick lessons for yourself out of your books. Davy, I have not that confidence in myself to think I should be a good teacher of myself. But you are a good teacher of me, sir. I try, but then I am set to teach you, and I am not set to teach myself. I am only set to make myself do what I am taught. When you are my teacher, Davy, I try, don't I, to do everything you tell me? "'Yes, indeed, sir. But I am not set to obey myself.' "'No, nor anyone else, sir. You do not need to obey anyone, or have anyone teach you, sir.' "'Oh, don't I, Davy? On the contrary, I could not get on for one solitary moment without somebody to teach me. Look you here, Davy. I have so many lessons given me that I have no time or need to add to them any of my own. If you were to ask the cook to let you have a cold dinner, you would perhaps eat it with pride.' and take credit for what your hunger yet made quite agreeable to you. But the boy who does not grumble when he is told not to go out because it is raining and he has a cold, will not perhaps grumble either, should he happen to find his dinner not at all nice. Davy hung his head. It had been a very small grumble, but there are no sins for which there is less reason or less excuse than small ones. In no sense are they worth committing. And we grown people commit many more such than little children, and have our reward in childishness instead of childlikeness. It is so easy, continued Donal, to do the thing we ordain ourselves, for in holding to it we make ourselves out fine fellows, and that is such a mean kind of thing. Then when another who has the right lays a thing upon us, we grumble, though it be the truest and kindest thing, 
and the most reasonable and needful for us, even for our dignity, for our being worth anything. Depend upon it, Davy, to do what we are told is a far grander thing than to lay the severest rules upon ourselves. I and to stick to them, too. But might there not be something good for us to do that we were not told of? Whoever does the thing he is told to do, the thing, that is, that has a plain ought in it, will become satisfied that there is one who will not forget to tell him what must be done as soon as he is fit to do it. The conversation lasted only while Donal ate his breakfast, with the little fellow standing beside him. It was soon over, but not soon to be forgotten. For the readiness of the boy to do what his master told him was beautiful, and a great help and comfort, sometimes a rousing rebuke to his master, whose thoughts would yet occasionally tumble into one of the pitfalls of sorrow. What, he would say to himself, am I so believed in by this child that he goes at once to do my words, and shall I for a moment doubt the heart of the father, or his power or will to set right whatever may have seemed to go wrong with his child? Go on, Davy, you are a good boy. I will be a better man. But naturally, as soon as lessons were over, he fell again to thinking what could have befallen him the night before. At what point did the aberration begin? The Earl must have taken notice of it, for surely Simmons had not given Davy those injunctions of himself, except indeed he had exposed his condition even to him. If the Earl had spoken to Simmons, kindness seemed intended him, but it might have been merely care over the boy. Anyhow, what was to be done? He did not ponder the matter long. With that directness which was one of the most marked features of his nature, he resolved at once to request an interview with the Earl, and make his apologies. He sought Simmons, therefore, and found him in the pantry rubbing up the forks and spoons. "'Ah, Mr. Grant,' he said, before Donal could speak, "'I was just coming to you with a message from his lordship. He wants to see you.' "'And I came to you,' replied Donal, "'to say I wanted to see his lordship.' "'That's well fitted, then, sir,' returned Simmons. "'I will go and see when. His lordship is not up, nor likely to be for some hours yet.' He is in one of his low fits this morning. He told me you were not quite yourself last night. As he spoke, his red nose seemed to examine Donal's face with a kindly but not altogether sympathetic scrutiny. The fact is, Simmons, answered Donal, not being used to wine, I fear I drank more of his lordship's than was good for me. His lordship's wine, murmured Simmons, and there checked himself. How much did you drink, sir, if I may make so bold? I had one glass during dinner, and more than one, but not nearly two, after. Pooh, pooh, sir, that could never hurt a strong man like you. You ought to know better than that. Look at me. But he did not go on with his illustration. Tut, he resumed, that make you sleep till ten o'clock. If you will kindly wait in the hall, or in the schoolroom, I will bring you his lordship's orders. So saying, while he washed his hands and took off his white apron, Simmons departed on his errand to his master. Donal went to the foot of the grand staircase, and there waited. As he stood, he heard a light step above him, and involuntarily glancing up, saw the light shape of Lady Arctura come round the curve of the spiral stair, descending rather slowly and very softly, as if her feet were thinking. She checked herself for an infinitesimal moment, then moved on again. Donal stood with bended head as she passed. If she acknowledged his obeisance, it was with the slightest return, but she lifted her eyes to his face with a look that seemed to have in it a strange wistful trouble, not very marked, yet notable. She passed on and vanished, leaving that look a lingering presence in Donal's thought. What was it? Was it anything? What could it mean? Had he really seen it? Was it there, or had he only imagined it? Simmons kept him waiting a good while. He had found his lordship getting up, and had had to stay to help him dress. At length he came, excusing himself that his lordship's temper at such times, that was, in his dumpy fits, was not one of the evenest, and required a gentle hand. But his lordship would see him, and could Mr. Grant find the way himself, for his old bones ached with running up and down those endless stone steps. Donal answered he knew the way, and sprang up the stair. But his mind was more occupied with the coming interview than with the way to it, which caused him to take a wrong turn after leaving the stair. He had a good gift in space relations, but instinct was here not so keen as on a hillside. The consequence was that he found himself in the picture gallery. 
A strange feeling of pain, as at the presence of a condition he did not wish to encourage, awoke in him at the discovery. He walked along, however, thus taking, he thought, the readiest way to his lordship's apartment. Either he would find him in his bedroom, or could go through that to his sitting-room. He glanced at the pictures he passed, and seemed, strange to say, though so far as he knew he had never been in the place except in the dark, to recognize some of them as belonging to the stuff of the dream in which he had been wandering through the night. Only that was a glowing and gorgeous dream, whereas the pictures were even commonplace. Here was something to be meditated upon, but for the present postponed. His lordship was expecting him. Arrived, as he thought, at the door of the earl's bedroom, he knocked, and receiving no answer, opened it, and found himself in a narrow passage. Nearly opposite was another door, partly open, and hearing a movement within, he ventured to knock there. A voice he knew at once to be Lady Arcturus invited him to enter. It was an old, lovely, gloomy little room, in which the lady sat writing. It had but one low lattice window, to the west, but a fire blazed cheerfully in the old-fashioned grate. She looked up, nor showed more surprise than if he had been a servant she had rung for. "'I beg your pardon, my lady,' he said. "'My lord wished to see me, but I have lost my way.' "'I will show it you,' she answered, and rising came to him. She led him along the winding, narrow passage, pointed out to him the door of his lordship's sitting-room, and turned away. Again, Donal could not help thinking, with a look as of some anxiety about him. He knocked, and the voice of the earl bade him enter. His lordship was in his dressing-gown, on a couch of faded satin of a gold colour, against which his pale yellow face looked cadaverous. "'Good morning, Mr. Grant,' he said. "'I am glad to see you better.' "'I thank you, my lord,' returned Donal. "'I have to make an apology. "'I cannot understand how it was, except, perhaps, "'that being so little accustomed to strong drink, "'there is not the smallest occasion to say a word,' "'interrupted his lordship. "'You did not once forget yourself, "'or cease to behave like a gentleman. "'Your lordship is very kind. "'Still I cannot help being sorry. "'I shall take good care in the future.' "'It might be as well,' conceded the earl, "'to set yourself a limit.' "'necessarily, in your case, a narrow one. "'Some constitutions are so immediately responsive,' "'he added in a murmur. "'The least exhibition of... "'But a man like you, Mr. Grant,' he went on aloud, "'will always know to take care of himself.' "'Sometimes, apparently, when it is too late,' rejoined Donal. "'But I must not annoy your lordship "'with any further expression of my regret. "'Will you dine with me tonight?' said the Earl. "'I am lonely now.' "'Sometimes, for months together, I feel no need of a companion. "'My books and pictures content me. "'All at once a longing for society will seize me, "'and that longing my health will not permit me to indulge. "'I am not by nature unsociable, much the contrary. "'You may wonder I do not admit my own family more freely, "'but my wretched health makes me shrink from loud voices and abrupt motions.' "'But Lady Arctura,' thought Donal, "'your lordship will find me a poor substitute, I fear,' he said, for the society you would like, but I am at your lordship's service. He could not help turning with a moment's longing and regret to his tower nest and the company of his books and thoughts, but he did not feel that he had a choice. End of chapter 31《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.》For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Recording by Devorah Allen《Donald Grant by George MacDonald》Chapter 32 The Second Dinner with the Earl He went as before, conducted by the butler, and formally announced. To his surprise, with the Earl was Lady Arctura. His lordship made him give her his arm, and followed. This was to Donal a very different dinner from that of the evening before. Whether the presence of his niece made the earl rouse himself to be agreeable, or he had grown better since the morning and his spirits had risen, certainly he was not like the same man. He talked in a rather forced playful way, but told two or three good stories, described with vivacity some of the adventures of his youth, spoke of several great men he had met, 
and in short was all that could be desired in a host. Donal took no wine during dinner. The earl, as before, took very little, and Lady Arctura none. She listened respectfully to her uncle's talk, and was attentive when Donal spoke. He thought she looked even sympathetic two or three times, and once he caught the expression as of anxiety he had seen on her face that same day twice before. It was strange, too, he thought, that not seeing her sometimes for a week together, he should thus meet her three times in one day. When the last of the dinner was removed and the wine placed on the table, Donal thought his lordship looked as if he expected his niece to go, but she kept her place. He asked her which wine she would have, but she declined any. He filled his glass and pushed the decanter to Donal. He too filled his glass and drank slowly. The talk revived. But Donal could not help fancying that the eyes of the lady now and then sought his with a sort of question in them, almost as if she feared something was going to happen to him. He attributed this to her having heard that he took too much wine the night before. The situation was unpleasant. He must, however, brave it out. When he refused a second glass, which the earl by no means pressed, he thought he saw her look relieved, but more than once thereafter he saw, or fancied he saw her glance at him with that expression of slight anxiety. In its course the talk fell upon sheep, and Donal was relating some of his experiences with them and their dogs, greatly interested in the subject, when all at once, just as before, something seemed to burst in his head, and immediately, although he knew he was sitting at table with the earl and Lady Arctura, he was uncertain whether he was not at the same time upon the side of a lonely hill, closed in a magic night of high summer, his woolly and hairy friends lying all about him, and a light glimmering faintly on the heather a little way off, which he knew for the flame that marks for a moment the footstep of an angel, when he touches ever so lightly the solid earth. He seemed to be reading the thoughts of his sheep around him, yet all the time went on talking, and knew he was talking, with the earl and the lady. After a while everything was changed. He was no longer either with his sheep or his company. He was alone, and walking swiftly through and beyond the park, in a fierce wind from the northeast, battling with it, and ruling it like a fiery horse. By and by came a hoarse, terrible music, which he knew for the thunderous beat of the waves on the low shore, yet imagined issuing from an indescribable instrument, gigantic and grotesque. He felt it first, through his feet, as one feels without hearing the tones of an organ for which the building is too small to allow scope to their vibration. The waves made the ground beat against the soles of his feet as he walked, but soon he heard it like the infinitely prolonged roaring of a sky-built organ. It was drawing him to the sea, whether in the body or out of the body he knew not. He was but conscious of forms of existence, whether those forms had relation to things outside him, or whether they belonged only to the world within him, he was unaware. The roaring of the great water organ grew louder and louder. He knew every step of the way to the shore, across the fields and over fences and stiles. He turned this way and that, to avoid here a ditch, there a deep sandy patch. And still the music grew louder and louder, and at length came in his face the driving spray. It was the flying touch of the wings on which the tones went hurrying past into the depths of awful distance. His feet were now wading through the bent tufted sand, with the hard, bare, wave-beaten sand in front of him. Through the dark he could see the white fierceness of the hurrying waves as they rushed to the shore, then leaning, toppling, curling, self-undermined, hurled forth all at once the sound that was in them in a falling roar of defeat. Every wave was a complex chord with winnowed tones feathering it round. He paced up and down the sand. It seemed for ages. Why he paced there he did not know. Why always he turned and went back instead of going on. Suddenly he thought he saw something dark in the hollow of a wave that swept to its fall. The moon came out as it broke, and the something was rolled in the surf up the shore. Donal stood watching it. Why should he move? What was it to him? The next wave would reclaim it for the ocean. It looked like the body of a man, but what did it matter? Many such were tossed in the hollows of that music. But something came back to him out of the ancient years. In the ages gone by, men did what they could. There was a word they used then. They said men ought to do this or that. This body might not be dead. Or dead, someone might like to have it. 
He rushed into the water and caught it. Ere the next wave broke, though hours of cogitation, ratiocination, recollection, seemed to have intervened. The breaking wave drenched him from head to foot. He clung to his prize and dragged it out. A moment's bewilderment, and he came to himself lying on the sand, his arms round a great lump of net, lost from some fishing boat. His illusions were gone. He was sitting in a cold wind, wet to the skin, on the border of a wild sea. A poor, shivering, altogether ordinary and uncomfortable mortal, he sat on the shore of the German Ocean, from which he had rescued a tangled mass of net and seaweed. He dragged it beyond the reach of the waves, and set out for home. By the time he reached the castle he was quite warm. His door at the foot of the tower was open. He crept up and was soon fast asleep. End of chapter 32《Chapter 33 of Donal Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Donal Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 33 The Housekeeper's Room He was not so late the next morning. Ere he had finished his breakfast, he had made up his mind that he must beware of the earl. He was satisfied that the experiences of the past night could not be the consequence of one glass of wine. If he asked him again, he would go to dinner with him, but would drink nothing but water. School was just over when Simmons came from his lordship to inquire after him, and invite him to dine with him that evening. Donal immediately consented. This time Lady Arctura was not with the earl. After, as during dinner, Donal declined to drink. His lordship cast on him a keen, searching glance, but it was only a glance, and took no farther notice of his refusal. The conversation, however, which had not been brilliant from the first, now sank and sank till it was not. And after a cup of coffee, his lordship, remarking that he was not feeling himself, begged Donal to excuse him, and proceeded to retire. Donal rose, and with a hope that his lordship would have a good night and feel better in the morning, left the room. The passage outside was lighted only by a rather dim lamp, and in the distance Donal saw what he could but distinguish as the form of a woman, standing by the door which opened upon the great staircase. He supposed it at first to be one of the maids, but the servants were so few compared with the size of the castle that one was seldom to be met on stair or in passage, and besides, the form stood as if waiting for someone. As he drew nearer, he saw it was Lady Arctura, and would have passed with an obeisance. But ere he could lay his hand on the lock, hers was there to prevent him. He then saw that she was agitated, and that she had stopped him thus because her voice had at the moment failed her. The next moment, however, she recovered it and her self-possession as well. "'Mr. Grant,' she said in a low voice, "'I wish to speak to you.' if you will allow me. I am at your service, my lady, answered Donal. But we cannot hear. My uncle, shall we go into the picture gallery? suggested Donal. There is moonlight there. No, that would be still nearer, my uncle. His hearing is sometimes preternaturally keen, and besides, as you know, he often walks there after his evening meal. But, excuse me, Mr. Grant, you will understand me presently. Are you, are you quite... "'You mean, my lady, am I quite myself this evening?' said Donal, wishing to help her with the embarrassing question. "'I have drunk nothing but water to-night.' With that she opened the door, and descended the stair, he following. But as soon as the curve of the staircase hid the door they had left, she stopped, and turning to him, said, "'I would not have you mistake me, Mr. Grant. I should be ashamed to speak to you if—' "'Indeed, I am very sorry,' said Donal, "'though hardly so much to blame as I fear you think me.' "'You mistake me at once. "'You suppose I imagine you took too much wine last night. "'It would be absurd. "'I saw what you took. "'But we must not talk here. "'Come.' "'She turned again, and going down, "'led the way to the housekeeper's room. "'They found her at work with her needle. "'Mistress Brooks,' said Lady Arctura, "'I want to have a little talk with Mr. Grant, "'and there is no fire in the library. "'May we sit here?' "'By all means. "'Sit down, my lady. "'Why, Bairn?' "'You look as cold as if you'd been on the roof. "'There, sit close to the fire. "'You're all trembling.' 
Lady Arctura obeyed like the child Mistress Brooks called her, and sat down in the chair she gave up to her. "'I've something to see after in the still room,' said the housekeeper. "'You sit here and how you crack. Sit down, Mr. Grant. I'm glad to see you and my lady come to word of mouth at last. I began to think it would never be.' Had Donald been in the way of looking to faces for the interpretation of words and thoughts, he would have seen a shadow sweep over Lady Arctura's, followed by a flush, which he would have attributed to displeasure at this utterance of the housekeeper. But with all his experience of the world within, and all his unusually developed power of entering into the feelings of others, he had never come to pry into those feelings, or to study their phenomena for the sake of possessing himself of them. Man was by no means an open book to him, no, nor woman neither. But he would have scorned to supplement by such investigation what a lady chose to tell him. He sat looking into the fire, with an occasional upward glance, waiting for what was to come, and saw neither shadow nor flush. Lady Arctura sat also gazing into the fire, and seemed in no haste to begin. "'You are so good to Davy,' she said at length, and stopped. "'No better than I have to be,' returned Donal. "'Not to be good to Davy would be to be a wretch.' "'You know, Mr. Grant, I cannot agree with you. "'There is no immediate necessity, my lady.' "'But I suppose one may be fair to another,' she went on doubtingly. "'And it is only fair to confess that he is much more manageable since you came. "'Only that is no good if it does not come from the right source. "'Grapes do not come from thorns, my lady. "'We must not allow an evil a power of good.' "'She did not reply. "'He minds everything I say to him now,' she resumed. "'What is it makes him so good? "'I wish I had had such a tutor.' "'She stopped again. "'She had spoken out of the simplicity of her thought, "'but the words, when said, "'looked to her as if they ought not to have been said. "'Something is working in her,' thought Donal. "'She is so different. "'Her voice is different. "'But that is not what I wanted to speak to you about, Mr. Grant,' "'she recommenced, "'though I did want you to know I was aware of the improvement in Davy. I wish to say something about my uncle. Here followed another pause. You may have remarked, she said at length, that though we live together, and he is my guardian and the head of the house, there is not much communication between us. I have gathered as much. I ask no questions, but I cannot tell Davy not to talk to me. Of course not. Lord Morven is a strange man. I do not understand him, and I do not want to judge him, or make you judge him, but I must speak of a fact concerning yourself which I have no right to keep from you. Once more a pause followed. There was nothing now of the grand dame about Arctura. "'Has nothing occurred to wake a doubt in you?' she said at last, abruptly. "'Have you not suspected him of—of of using you in any way?' "'I have had an undefined ghost of a suspicion,' answered Donal. "'Please tell me what you know.' "'I should know nothing.' although my room being near his I should have been the more perplexed about some things, had he not made an experiment upon myself a year ago. Is it possible? I sometimes fancy I have not been so well since. It was a great shock to me when I came to myself. You see, I am trusting you, Mr. Grant. I thank you heartily, my lady, said Donal. I believe, continued Lady Arctura, gathering courage, that my uncle is in the habit of taking some horrible drug for the sake of its effect on his brain. There are people who do so. What it is I don't know, and I would rather not know. It is just as bad, surely, as taking too much wine. I have heard himself remark to Mr. Carmichael that opium was worse than wine, for it destroyed the moral sense more. Mind, I don't say it is opium he takes. There are other things, said Donal, even worse. But surely you do not mean he dared try anything of the sort on you. I am sure he gave me something, for once that I dined with him, but I cannot describe the effect it had upon me. I think he wanted to see its operation on one who did not even know she had taken anything. The influence of such things is a pleasant one, they say, at first, but I would not go through such agonies as I had for the world. She ceased, evidently troubled by the harassing remembrance. Donal hastened to speak. It was because of such a suspicion, my lady that this evening I would not even taste his wine. I am safe to-night, I trust, from the insanity, I can call it nothing else, that possessed me the last two nights. Was it very dreadful? asked Lady Arctura. On the contrary, I had a sense of life and power such as I could never of myself have imagined. Oh, Mr. Grant, do take care, 
Do not be tempted to take it again. I don't know where it might not have led me if I had found it as pleasant as it was horrible, for I am sorely tried with painful thoughts, and feel sometimes as if I would do almost anything to get rid of them. There must be a good way of getting rid of them. Think of it of God's mercy, said Donal, that you cannot get rid of them the other way. I do. I do. The shield of his presence was over you. How glad I should be to think so. But we have no right to think he cares for us till we believe in Christ, and... and... I don't know that I do believe in him. Wherever you learn that, it is a terrible lie, said Donal. Is not Christ the same always? And is he not of one mind with God? Was it not while we were yet sinners that he poured out his soul for us? It is a fearful thing to say of the perfect love that he is not doing all he can, with all the power of a maker over the creature he has made, to help and deliver him. I know he makes his sun to shine and his rain to fall upon the evil and the good, but those good things are only of this world. Are those the good things, then, that the Lord says the Father will give to those that ask him? How can you worship a God who gives you all the little things he does not care much about, but will not do his best for you? But are there not things he cannot do for us till we believe in Christ? Certainly there are. But what I want you to see is that he does all that can be done. He finds it very hard to teach us, but he is never tired of trying. Anyone who is willing to be taught of God will by him be taught, and thoroughly taught. I am afraid I am doing wrong in listening to you, Mr. Grant, and the more that I cannot help wishing what you say might be true. But are you not in danger, you will pardon me for saying it, of presumption? How can all the good people be wrong? Because the greater part of their teachers have set themselves to explain God, rather than to obey and enforce his will. The gospel is given to convince not our understandings, but our hearts. That done, and never till then, our understandings will be free. Our Lord said he had many things to tell his disciples, but they were not able to hear them. If the things be true which I have heard from Sunday to Sunday since I came here, the Lord has brought us no salvation at all, but only a change of shape to our miseries. They have not redeemed you, Lady Arctura, and never will. Nothing but Christ himself, your Lord and friend and brother, not all the doctrines about him, even if every one of them were true, can save you. Poor orphan children, we cannot find our God, and they would have us take instead a shocking caricature of him. But how should sinners know what is or is not like the true God? If a man desires God, he cannot help knowing enough of him to be capable of learning more. Else how should he desire him? Made in the image of God, his idea of him cannot be all wrong. That does not make him fit to teach others, only fit to go on learning for himself. But in Jesus Christ... I see the very God I want. I want a father like him. He reproaches some of those about him for not knowing him. For if they had known God, they would have known him. They were to blame for not knowing God. No other than the God exactly like Christ can be the true God. It is a doctrine of devils that Jesus died to save us from our Father. There is no safety, no good, no gladness, no purity, but with the Father, his Father and our Father, his God and our God. But God hates sin and punishes it. It would be terrible if he did not. All hatred of sin is love to the sinner. Do you think Jesus came to deliver us from the punishment of our sins? He would not have moved a step for that. The horrible thing is being bad, and all punishment is helped to deliver us from that. Nor will punishment cease till we have ceased to be bad. God will have us good, and Jesus works out the will of his Father. Where is the refuge of the child who fears his father? Is it in the farthest corner of the room? Is it down in the dungeon of the castle, my lady? No, no, cried Lady Arctura. In his father's arms. There, said Donal, and was silent. I hold by Jesus, he added after a pause, and rose as he said it, but stood where he rose. Lady Arctura sat motionless, divided between reverence for distorted and false forms of truth taught her from her earliest years, and desire after a God whose very being is the bliss of his creatures. Some time passed in silence, and then she too rose to depart. She held out her hand to Donal with a kind of irresolute motion, but withdrawing it, smiled almost beseechingly, and said, I wish I might ask you something. I know it is a rude question, but if you could see all, you would answer me and let the offense go. I will answer anything you choose to ask. That makes it the more difficult. But I will. I cannot bear to remain longer in doubt. 
Did you really write that poem you gave to Kate Graham? Compose it, I mean, your own self? I made no secret of that when I gave it her, said Donal, not perceiving her drift. Then you did really write it? Donal looked at her in perplexity. Her face grew very red, and tears began to come in her eyes. You must pardon me, she said. I am so ignorant, and we live in such an out-of-the-way place that— that it seems very unlikely a real poet. And then I have been told there are people who have a passion for appearing to do the thing they are not able to do, and I was anxious to be quite sure. My mind would keep brooding over it and wondering and longing to know for certain, so I resolved at last that I would be rid of the doubt even at the risk of offending you. I know I have been rude, unpardonably rude, but— But, supplemented Donal, with a most sympathetic smile, for he understood her as his own thought— you do not feel quite sure yet. What a priori reason do you see why I should not be able to write verses? There is no rule as to where poetry grows. One place is as good as another for that. I hope you will forgive me. I hope I have not offended you very much. Nobody in such a world as this ought to be offended at being asked for proof. If there are in it rogues that look like honest men, how is anyone without a special gift of insight to be always sure of the honest man? Even the man whom a woman loves best will sometimes tear her heart to pieces. I will give you all the proof you can desire. And lest the tempter should say I made up the proof itself between now and tomorrow morning, I will fetch it at once. Oh, Mr. Grant, spare me. I am not, indeed, I am not so bad as that. Who can tell when or whence the doubt may wake again, or what may wake it? At least let me explain a little before you go, she said. Certainly, he answered, reseating himself in compliance with her example. "'Miss Graham told me that you had never seen a garden like theirs before.' "'I never did. "'There are none such, I fancy, in our part of the country. "'Nor in our neighbourhood, either. "'Then what is surprising in it?' "'Nothing in that. "'But is there not something in your being able to write a poem like that "'about a garden such as you had never seen? "'One would say you must have been familiar with it from childhood "'to be able so to enter into the spirit of the place.' "'Perhaps if I had been familiar with it from childhood,' That might have disabled me from feeling the spirit of it, for then might it not have looked to me as it looked to those in whose time such gardens were the fashion? Two things are necessary. First, that there should be a spirit in a place, and next, that the place should be seen by one whose spirit is capable of giving house-room to its spirit. By the way, does the ghost lady feel the place all right? I am not sure that I know what you mean, but I felt the grass with her feet as I read, and the wind lifting my hair— I seemed to know exactly how she felt. Now tell me, were you ever a ghost? No, she answered, looking in his face like a child, without even a smile. Did you ever see a ghost? No, never. Then how should you know how a ghost would feel? I see. I cannot answer you. Donal rose. I am indeed ashamed, said Lady Arctura. Ashamed of giving me the chance of proving myself a true man? That, at least, is no longer necessary. But I want my revenge. As a punishment for doubting one whom you had so little ground for believing, you shall be compelled to see the proof. That is, if you will do me the favor to wait here till I come back. I shall not be long, though it is some distance to the top of Balliol's tower. Davy told me your room was there. Do you not find it cold? It must be very lonely. I wonder why Mistress Brooks put you there. Donal assured her he could not have had a place more to his mind, and before she could well think he had reached the foot of his stair, was back with a roll of papers, which he laid on the table. There, he said, opening it out, if you will take the trouble to go over these, you may read the growth of the poem. Here first you see it blocked out rather roughly, and much blotted with erasures and substitutions. Here next you see the result copied, clean to begin with, but afterwards scored and scored. You see the words I chose instead of the first, and afterwards in their turn rejected, until in the proofs I reach those which I have as yet let stand. I do not fancy Miss Graham has any doubt the verses are mine, for it was plain she thought them rubbish. From your pains to know who wrote them, I believe you do not think so badly of them. She thought he was satirical, and gave a slight sigh as of pain. It went to his heart. I did not mean the smallest reflection, my lady, on your desire for satisfaction, he said. "'Rather, indeed, it flatters me. "'But is it not strange the heart should be less ready to believe "'what seems worth believing? "'Something must be true. "'Why not the worthy? "'Oftener, at least, than the unworthy. 
Why should it be easier to believe hard things of God, for instance, than lovely things? Or that one man copied from another, than that he should have made the thing himself? Some would yet say I contrived all this semblance of composition in order to lay the surer claim to that to which I had none, nor would take the trouble to follow the thing through its development. But it will be easy for you, my lady, and no bad exercise in logic and analysis, to determine whether the genuine growth of the poem be before you in these papers or not. "'I shall find it most interesting,' said Lady Arctura. "'So much I can tell already. "'I never saw anything of the kind before, "'and had no idea how poetry was made. "'Does it always take so much labor? "'Some verses take much more. "'Some none at all. "'The labor is in getting the husks of expression cleared off, "'so that the thought may show itself plainly.' "'At this point, Mrs. Brooks, "'thinking probably the young people had had long enough conference, "'entered, and after a little talk with her, Lady Arctura kissed her and bade her good night. Donal retired to his aerial chamber, wondering whether the lady of the house had indeed changed as much as she seemed to have changed. From that time, whether it was that Lady Arctura had previously avoided meeting him and now did not, or from other causes, Donal and she met much oftener as they went about the place, nor did they ever pass without a mutual smile and greeting. The next day but one, she brought him his papers to the schoolroom. She had read every erasure and correction, she told him, and could no longer have had a doubt that the writer of the papers was the maker of the verses, even had she not previously learned thorough confidence in the man himself. They would possibly fail to convince a jury, though, he said, as he rose and went to throw them in the fire. Divining his intent, Arctura darted after him, and caught them just in time. Let me keep them, she pleaded, for my humiliation. Do with them what you like, my lady, said Donal. They are of no value to me, except that you care for them. End of chapter 33、Chapter、34 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter thirty four Cobbler and Castle. In the bosom of the family in which the elements seem most kindly mixed, there may yet lie some root of discord and disruption, upon which the foreign influence necessary to its appearance above ground has not yet come to operate. That things are quiet is no proof, only a hopeful sign of harmony. In a family of such poor accord as that at the castle, the peace might well at any moment be broken. Lord Forgue had been for some time on a visit to Edinburgh, had doubtless there been made much of, and had returned with a considerable development of haughtiness, and of that freedom which means subjugation to self, and freedom from the law of liberty. It is often when a man is least satisfied, not with himself but with his immediate doings, that he is most ready to assert his superiority to the restraints he might formerly have grumbled against, but had not dared to dispute, and to claim from others such consideration as accords with a false idea of his personal standing. But for a while, Donal and he barely saw each other. Donal had no occasion to regard him, and Lord Forgue kept so much to himself that Davy made lamentation. Percy was not half so jolly as he used to be. For a fortnight Eppie had not been to see her grandparents, and as the last week something had prevented Donal also from paying them his customary visit, the old people had naturally become uneasy. And one frosty twilight, when the last of the sunlight had turned to cold green in the west, Andrew Coleman appeared in the castle kitchen, asking to see Mistress Brooks. He was kindly received by the servants, among whom Eppie was not present, and Mrs. Brooks, who had a genuine respect for the cobbler, soon came to greet him. She told him she knew no reason why Eppie had not gone to inquire after them as usual. She would send for her, she said, and left the kitchen. Eppie was not at the moment to be found, but Donal, whom Mistress Brooks had gone herself to seek, went at once to the kitchen. "'Will you come out a bit, Andrew?' he said, "'if you're not tired. It's a fine night, and it's easy to talk in the gloamin'. Andrew consented with alacrity. On the side of the castle away from the town, the descent was at first by a succession of terraces with steps from the one to the other, the terraces themselves being little flower gardens. 
At the bottom of the last of these terraces, and parallel with them, was a double row of trees, forming a long narrow avenue between two doors and two walls at opposite ends of the castle. One of these led to some of the offices. The other admitted to a fruit garden, which turned the western shoulder of the hill, and found for the greater part a nearly southern exposure. At this time of the year it was a lonely enough place, and at this time of the day more than likely to be altogether deserted. Thither Donal would lead his friend. Going out, therefore, by the kitchen door, they went first into a stable-yard, from which descended steps to the castle well, on the level of the second terrace. Thence they arrived, by more steps, at the mews where in old times the hawks were kept, now rather ruinous, though not quite neglected. Here the one wall-door opened on the avenue, which led to the other. It was one of the pleasantest walks in immediate proximity to the castle. The first of the steely stars were shining through the naked rafters of leafless boughs overhead, as Donal and the cobbler stepped, gently talking, into the aisle of trees. The old man looked up, gazed for a moment in silence, and said, "'The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I used when I was a lad to study astronomy a wee, in the hope of better hearing what the heavens declared about the glory of God. I would fain understand the speech one day cried across the night to the other.' "'But I was sair disappointed. "'The things the astronomer tellt simple folk were very wonderful, "'but I couldna find it in my heart "'that they made me think any mair o' God nor I did afore. "'I didna mean to say they might not be competent to work that in another, "'but it wasna my experience o' them. "'My heart was some sair at this, "'for, you see, I was set upon winning into the presence o' him "'I couldna bide frae, "'and at that time I had not learnt to going straight "'to him who is the express image of his person, "'but I sought him through the philosophy. "'Eh, it was barely philosophy.' "'of the good books that dwell upon the nature of God and all that, "'and his hatred of sin and all that. "'Part and part true, no doubt. "'But I wanted God great and near, "'and they made him out small, "'small and uncle far away. "'One night I was out by my sail upon the shore, "'just as the stars were teetin' out. "'And it was not as gin they were fear to the sun, "'and pleased that he was gone, "'but as gin they were a teetin' out to see "'what had come of their father or lights. "'All at once I came to myself, like out of some blind delusion. Up I cast my ain abon, and eh, there was the heaven as God made it. Awful. Big and deep. Ay, fathomless deep, and full of the wondering yet steady lights that nothing can blow out but the breath of his mouth. Away and up it goed, and deeper and deeper, and my ain gud travelling away and away, till it seemed as though they could never win back to me. All at once they drop it for the lift like a laverock, and light it upon the horizon where the sea and the sky met like righteousness and peace kissing one another, as the psalm says. Now I cannot tell what it was, but just there where the earth and the sky came together was the meeting of my earthly soul with God's heavenly soul. There was bonny colours and bonny lights, and a bonny great star hanging o'er a But it was none of all those things. It was something deeper nor all, and higher nor all. For that moment I saw, not how the heavens declared the glory of God, but I saw them declaring it. "'and I want it no mair. "'Astronomy for me might sit and wait for a better world, "'where folk didna wear out their shoon, "'and either folk had not to mend them. "'For what is the great glory of God but that, "'though no man can comprehend him, "'he comes down and lays his cheek till his man's, "'and says to him, "'Eh, my creature!' "'While the cobbler was thus talking, "'they had gone the length of the avenue, "'and were within less than two trees "'of the door of the fruit garden, "'when it opened.' and was hurriedly shut again. Not, however, before Donal had caught sight, as he believed, of the form of Eppie. He called her by name, and ran to the door, followed by Andrew. The same suspicion had struck both of them at once. Donal lifted the latch, and would have opened the door, but someone held it against him, and he heard the noise of an attempt to push the rusty bolt into the staple. He set his strength to it, and forced the door open. Lord Forgu was on the other side of it, and a little way off stood Eppie trembling. Donal turned away from his lordship, and said to the girl, "'Eppie, here's your grandfather come to see you.' The cobbler, however, went up to Lord Forgu. "'You are a young man, my lord,' he said, "'and may regard it as folly in an old man to interfere between you and your will. But I warn you, my lord, except you cease to carry yourself thus towards my granddaughter, his lordship, your father, shall be informed of the matter. Eppie, you come home with me.' "'I will not,' said Eppie, her voice trembling with passion, though which passion it were hard to say. "'I'm a free woman. 
I make my own living. I will not be treated like a child. I will speak to Mistress Brooks, said the old man with sad dignity. And make him turn me away, said Eppie. She seemed quite changed, bold and determined, was probably relieved that she could no more play a false part. His lordship stood and said nothing. But don't you think, grandfather, continued Eppie, that whatever Mistress Brooks says or does, I'll go home with you. I've saved money, and as I can't get another place here when you've taken away my character, I'll leave the country. His lordship advanced, and with strained composure said, I confess, Mr. Coman, things do look against us. It is awkward you should have found us together, but you know, and here he attempted a laugh, we are told not to judge by appearances. We may be forced to act by them, though, my lord, said Andrew. I should be sorry to judge either of you by them. Eppy must come home with me, or it will be more awkward yet for both of you. Oh, if you threaten us, said Forgue contemptuously, then of course we are very frightened. But you had better beware. You will only make it the more difficult for me to do your granddaughter the justice I always intended. What your lordship's notion of justice may be, I will not trouble you to explain, said the old man. All I desire for the present is that she come home with me. Let us leave the matter to Mistress Brooks, said Forgue. I shall easily satisfy her that there is no occasion for any hurry. Believe me, you will only bring trouble on the innocent. Then it cannot be on you, my lord, for in this thing you have not behaved as a gentleman ought, said the cobbler. You dare tell me so, cried Forgue, striding up to the little old man, as if he would sweep him away with the very wind of his approach. Yes, for else how should I say it to another? and that may soon be necessary, answered the cobbler. Didn't your lordship promise an end to the whole miserable affair? I remember nothing of the sort. You did to me, said Donal. Do hold your tongue, Grant, and don't make things worse. To you I can easily explain it. Besides, you have nothing to do with it, now this good fellow has taken it up. It is quite possible, besides, to break one's word to the ear and yet keep it to the sense. The only thing to justify that suggestion, said Donal, would be that you had married Eppy or were about to marry her. Eppie would have spoken, but she only gave a little cry, for Forgo put his hand over her mouth. You hold your tongue, he said. You will only complicate matters. And there's another point, my lord, resumed Donal. You say I have nothing to do now with the affair. If not for my friend's sake, I have for my own. What do you mean? That I am in the house a paid servant, and must not allow anything mischievous to go on in it, without acquainting my master. You acknowledge, Mr. Grant, that you are neither more nor less than a paid servant, but you mistake your duty as such. I shall be happy to explain it to you. You have nothing whatever to do with what goes on in the house. You have but to mind your work. I told you before you are my brother's tutor, not mine. To interfere with what I do is nothing less than a piece of damned impertinence. That impertinence, however, I intend to be guilty of the moment I can get audience of your father. You will not, if I give you such explanation as satisfies you I have done the girl no harm, and mean honestly by her, Forgue said in a confident yet somewhat conciliatory tone. In any case, returned Donal, you having once promised, and then broken your promise, I shall without fail tell your father all I know. And ruin her, and perhaps me too, for life? The truth will ruin only those that ought to be ruined, said Donal. Forgue sprang upon him, and struck him a heavy blow between the eyes. He had been having lessons in boxing while in Edinburgh, and had confidence in himself. It was a well-planted blow, and Donal unprepared for it. He staggered against the wall, and for a moment could neither see nor think. All he knew was that there was something or other he had to attend to. His lordship, excusing himself perhaps on the ground of necessity, there being a girl in the case, would have struck him again, but Andrew threw himself between, and received the blow for him. As Donal came to himself, he heard a groan from the ground, and looking, saw Andrew at his feet, and understood. "'Dear old man,' he said, "'he dared to strike you.' "'He didn't mean it,' returned Andrew feebly. "'Are you in an orit, sir? He gave you a terrible one. You might have heard it cross the street.' "'I shall be all right in a minute,' answered Donal, wiping the blood out of his eyes. "'I've a good hard head, thank God. But what has become of them?' "'You did not think you would be waiting to see us come to ourselves.' said the cobbler. With Donal's help and great difficulty, he rose, and they stood looking at each other through the starlight, bewildered and uncertain. The cobbler was the first to recover his wits. "'It's in no manner of use,' he said, "'to rouse the castle with hue and cry. What how we to say but that we found the two in the garden together? 
it would but raise a clash. The which, fable or fact, would do nothing for nobody. His lordship mun be look ken, as ye say. But will his lordship believe you, sir? I'm summon a mind the young man's away till his father are ready, to prejudice him again anything he may say. That makes it the more necessary, said Donal, that I should go at once to his lordship. He will fall out upon me for not having told him at once, but I must not mind that. If I were not to tell him now, he would have a good case against me. They were already walking towards the house, the old man giving a groan now and then. He could not go in, he said. He would walk gently on, and Donal would overtake him. It was an hour and a half before Andrew got home, and Donal had not overtaken him. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Donald Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter thirty five. The Earl's Bedchamber. Having washed the blood from his face, Donald sought Simmons. "'His lordship can't see you now, I am sure, sir,' answered the butler. "'Lord Forgue is with him.' Donal turned and went straight up to Lord Morven's apartment. As he passed the door of his bedroom opening on the corridor, he heard voices in debate. He entered the sitting-room. There was no one there. It was not a time for ceremony. He knocked at the door of the bedroom. The voices within were loud, and no answer came. He knocked again and received an angry permission to enter. He entered closed the door behind him, and stood in sight of his lordship, waiting what should follow. Lord Morven was sitting up in bed, his face so pale and distorted that Donal thought elsewhere he should hardly have recognized it. The bed was a large four-post bed. Its curtains were drawn close to the posts, admitting as much air as possible. At the foot of it stood Lord Forgue, his handsome, shallow face flushed with anger, his right arm straight down by his side, and the hand of it clenched hard. He turned when Donal entered. A fiercer flush overspread his face, but almost immediately the look of rage yielded to one of determined insult. Possibly even the appearance of Donal was a relief to being alone with his father. Mm, "'Mr. Grant,' stammered his lordship, speaking with pain, "'you are well come, just in time to hear a father curse his son.' "'Even such a threat shall not make me play a dishonorable part,' said Forgue, "'looking, however, anything but honourable, "'for the heart, not the brain, moulds the expression. "'Mr. Grant,' resumed the father, "'I have found you a man of sense and refinement. "'If you had been tutor to this degenerate boy, "'the worst trouble of my life would not have overtaken me.' "'Forgu's lip curled, but he did not speak, "'and his father went on. "'Here is this fellow come to tell me to my face "'that he intends the ruin and disgrace of the family "'by a low marriage.' "'It will not be the first time it has been so disgraced,' retorted the son, "'if fresh peasant blood be indeed a disgrace to any family. "'Bah! the hus— "'Bah! the hussy is not even a wholesome peasant girl,' cried the father. "'Who do you think she is, Mr. Grant?' "'I do not need to guess, my lord,' replied Donal. "'I came now to inform your lordship of what I had myself seen. "'She must leave the house this instant.' "'Then I too leave it, my lord,' said Forgue. "'Where's your money?' "'returned the earl contemptuously. "'Forgue shifted to an attack upon Donal. "'Your lordship hardly places confidence in me,' he said, "'but it is not the less my duty to warn you against this man. "'Months ago he knew what was going on, "'and comes to tell you now because this evening I chastised him for his rude interference.' "'In cooler blood, Lord Forgue would not have shown such meanness. "'But passion brings to the front the thing that lurks.' "'and it is no doubt the necessity for forestalling his disclosure "'that I owe the present ingenuous confession,' said Lord Morven. "'But explain, Mr. Grant.' "'My lord,' said Donal calmly, "'I became aware that there was something between Lord Forgue and the girl, "'and was alarmed for the girl. "'She is the child of friends to whom I am much beholden. "'But on the promise of both that the thing should end, "'I concluded it better not to trouble your lordship. "'I may have blundered in this, but I did what seemed best.' This night, however, I discovered that things were going as before, and it became imperative on my position in your house that I should make your lordship acquainted with the fact. He asseverated there was nothing dishonest between them, but having deceived me once, how was I to trust him again? How, indeed, 
the young blackguard, said his lordship, casting a fierce glance at his son. "'Allow me to remark,' said Forgue, with comparative coolness, "'that I deceived no one. What I promised was that the affair should not go on. It did not. From that moment it assumed a different and serious aspect. I now intend to marry the girl.' "'I tell you, Forgue, if you do, I will disown you.' Forgue smiled an impertinent smile, and held his peace. The threat had for him no terror. "'I shall be the better able,' continued his lordship, "'to provide suitably for Davy. He is what a son ought to be. But hear me, Forgu, you must be aware that if I left you all I had, it would be beggary for one handicapped with a title. You may think my anger unreasonable, but it comes solely of anxiety on your account. Nothing but a suitable marriage, the most suitable of all is within your arm's length, can save you from the life of a moneyless peer, the most pitiable object on the face of the earth. Were it possible to ignore your rank, you have no profession, no trade even, in these trade-loving times, to fall back upon. Except you marry as I please, you will have nothing from me but the contempt of a title without a farthing to keep it decent. You threaten to leave the house. Can you pay for a railway ticket? Forgue was silent for a moment. My lord, he said, I have given my word to the girl. Would you have me disgrace your name by breaking it? Tut, tut, there are words and words. What obligation can there be in the rash promises of an unworthy love? Still less are they binding where the man is not his own master. You are under a bond to your family, under a bond to society, under a bond to your country. Marry this girl and you will be an outcast. Marry as I would have you and no one will think the worse of you for a foolish vow in your boyhood. Bah, the merest rumor of it will never rise into the serene air of your position. And let the girl go and break her heart, said Forgu, with look black as death. You need fear no such catastrophe. You are no such marvel among men that a kitchen wench will break her heart for you. She will be sorry for herself, no doubt, but it will be nothing more than she expected, and will only confirm her opinion of you. She knows well enough the risk she runs. While he spoke, Donal, waiting his turn, stood as on hot iron. Such sayings were in his ears the foul talk of hell. The moment the earl ceased, he turned to Forgu and said, My lord, you have removed my harder thoughts of you. You have indeed broken your word, but in a way infinitely nobler than I believed you capable of. Lord Morven stared dumbfounded. "'Your comments are out of place, Mr. Grant,' said Forgue, with something like dignity. "'The matter is between my father and myself. If you wanted to beg my pardon, you should have waited a fitting opportunity.' Donal held his peace. He had felt bound to show sympathy with his enemy where he was right. The Earl was perplexed. His one poor ally had gone over to the enemy. He took a glass from the table beside him and drank. Then, after a moment's silence, apparently of exhaustion and suffering, said, "'Mr. Grant, I desire a word with you. Leave the room, Forgu.' "'My lord,' returned Forgu, "'you order me from the room to confer with one whose presence with you is an insult to me.' "'He seems to me,' answered his father bitterly, "'to be after your own mind in the affair. How indeed should it be otherwise? But so far I have found Mr. Grant a man of honour, and I desire to have some private conversation with him.' I therefore request you will leave us alone together. This was said so politely, yet with such latent command, that the youth dared not refuse compliance. The moment he closed the door behind him, I am glad he yielded, said the earl, for I should have had to ask you to put him out, and I hate rows. Would you have done it? I would have tried. Thank you. Yet a moment ago you took his part against me. On the girl's part, and for his honesty too, my lord. "'Come now, Mr. Grant. I understand your prejudices. I cannot expect you to look on the affair as I do. I am glad to have a man of such sound general principles to form the character of my younger son. But it is plain as a mountain that what would be the duty of a young man in your rank of life toward a young woman in the same rank would be simple ruin to one in Lord Forgue's position. A capable man like you can make a living a hundred different ways. To one born with the burden of a title, and without the means of supporting it, marriage with such a girl means poverty, gambling, "'Hunger, squabbling, dirt, suicide.' "'My lord,' answered Donal, "'the moment a man speaks of love to a woman, "'be she as lowly and ignorant as Mother Eve, "'that moment rank and privilege vanish, "'and distinction is annihilated.' "'The earl gave a small, sharp smile. "'You would make a good pleader, Mr. Grant. "'But if you had seen the consequences of such marriage "'half as often as I, you would modify your ideas. 
Mark what I say. This marriage shall not take place, by God. What, should I for a moment talk of it with coolness were there the smallest actual danger of its occurrence? Did I not know that it never could, never shall take place? The boy is a fool, and he shall know it. I have him in my power. Neck and heels in my power. He does not know it, and never could guess how, but it is true. One word from me, and the rascal is paralyzed. Oblige me by telling him what I have just said. The absurd marriage shall not take place, I repeat. Invalid as I am, I am not yet reduced to the condition of an obedient father. He took up a small bottle, poured a little from it, added water, and drank, then resumed. Now for the girl. Who knows about it? So far as I am aware, no one but her grandfather. He had come to the castle to inquire after her, and was with me when we came upon them in the fruit garden. Then let no further notice be taken of it. Tell no one, not even Mrs. Brooks. Let the young fools do as they please. I cannot consent to that, my lord. Why, what the devil have you to do with it? I am the friend of her people. Pooh, pooh, don't talk rubbish. What is it to them? I'll see to them. It will all come right. The affair will settle itself. By Jove, I'm sorry you interfered. The thing would have been much better left alone. My lord, said Donal, I can listen to nothing in this strain. All I ask is, promise not to interfere. I will not. Thank you. My lord, you mistake. I will not promise. Nay, I will interfere. What to do I do not now know, but I will save the girl if I can. And ruin an ancient family. You think nothing of that. Its honor, my lord, will be best preserved in that of the girl. Damn you! Will you preach to me? Notwithstanding his fierce words, Donal could not help seeing or imagining an almost suppliant look in his eye. "'You must do as I tell you in my house,' he went on, "'or you will soon see the outside of it. "'Come, marry the girl yourself. "'She is deuced pretty, "'and I will give you five hundred pounds for your wedding journey. "'Poor Davy. "'Your lordship insults me. "'Then damn you, be off to your lessons "'and take your insolent face out of my sight. "'If I remain in your house, my lord, "'it is for Davy's sake. "'Go away,' said the earl, and Donal went. "'He had hardly closed the door behind him.' when he heard a bell ring violently, and ere he reached the bottom of the stair, he met the butler panting up as fast as his short legs and red nose would permit. He would have stopped to question Donal, who hastened past him, and in the refuge of his own room sat down to think. Had his conventional dignity been with him a matter of importance, he would have left the castle the moment he got his things together, but he thought much more of Davy, and much more of Eppie. He had hardly seated himself when he jumped up again, he must see Andrew Coleman. End of chapter 35《Chapter 36 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald Chapter 36 A Night Watch When he reached the bottom of the hill, there at the gate was Forgu, walking up and down, apparently waiting for him. He would have passed him, but Forgu stepped in front of him. Grant, he said, it is well we should understand each other. I think, my lord, if you do not yet understand me, it can scarcely be my fault. What did my father say? I would deliver to your lordship a message he gave me for you, but for two reasons. One, that I believe he changed his mind, though he did not precisely say so, and the other, that I will not serve him or you in the matter. Then you intend neither to meddle nor make? That is my affair, my lord. I will not take your lordship into my confidence. Don't be unreasonable now. Do get off your high horse. Can't you understand a fellow? Everybody can't keep his temper as you do. I mean the girl no harm." I will not talk with you about her. And whatever you insist on saying to me, I will use against you without scruple, should occasion offer. As he spoke, he caught a look on Forgu's face which revealed somehow that it was not for him he had been waiting, but for Eppy. He turned and went back towards the castle. He might meet her. Forgu called after him, but he paid no heed. As he hastened up the hill, not so much as the rustle of bird or mouse did he hear. He lingered about the top of the road for half an hour, then turned and went to the cobbler's. 
he found Dory in great distress, for she was not merely sore troubled about her son's child, but Andrew was in bed and suffering great pain. The moment Donal saw him, he went for the doctor. He said a rib was broken, bound him up, and gave him some medicine. All done that could be done, Donal sat down to watch beside him. He lay still with closed eyes and white face. So patient was he that his very pain found utterance in a sort of blind smile. Donal did not know much about pain. He could read in Andrew's look his devotion to the will of him whose being was his peace. But he did not know above what suffering his faith lifted him and held him hovering yet safe. His faith made him one with life, the eternal life, and that is salvation. In closest contact with the divine, the original relation restored, the source once more holding its issue, the divine love pouring itself into the deepest vessel of the man's being, itself but a vessel for the holding of the diviner and divinest. Who can wonder if keenest pain should not be able to quench the smile of the prostrate? Few indeed have reached the point of health to laugh at disease, but are there none? Let not a man say because he cannot that no one can. The old woman was very calm, only every now and then she would lift her hands and shake her head, and look as if the universe were going to pieces, because her husband lay there by the stroke of the ungodly. And if he had lain there forgotten, then indeed the universe would have been going to pieces. When he coughed, every pang seemed to go through her body to her heart. Love is as lovely in the old as in the young. Lovelier when in them, as often, it is more sympathetic and unselfish. That is, more true. Donal wrote to Mrs. Brooks that he would not be home that night, and having found a messenger at the inn, settled himself to watch by his friend. The hours glided quietly over. Andrew slept a good deal, and seemed to have pleasant visions. He was finding yet more saving. Now and then his lips would move as if he were holding talk with some friendly soul. Once Donal heard the murmured words, Lord, I'm all your ain and noted that his sleep grew deeper thereafter. He did not wake till the day began to dawn. Then he asked for some water. Seeing Donal, and divining that he had been by his bedside all the night, he thanked him with a smile and a little nod, which somehow brought to his memory certain words Andrew had spoken on another occasion. There is one, and there is all, and the all is one, and the one is all. When Donal reached the castle, he found his breakfast and Mrs. Brooks waiting for him. She told him that Eppie, meeting her in the passage the night before, had burst into tears, but she could get nothing out of her, and had sent her to her room. This morning she had not come down at the proper time, and when she sent after her did not come. She went up herself, and found her determined to leave the castle that very day. She was now packing her things to go, nor did she see any good in trying to prevent her. Donal said if she would go home, there was plenty for her to do there. Old people's bones were not easy to mend, and it would be some time before her grandfather was well again. Mrs. Brooks said she would not keep her now if she begged to stay. She was afraid she would come to grief, and would rather she went home. She would take her home herself. The lass is not an ill one, she added, but she does not ken what she would be at. She wants some of the Lord's own disciplin, I'm thinking. And that you may be sure she'll get, Mrs. Brooks, said Donal. Eppie was quite ready to go home and help nurse her grandfather. She thought her conduct must by this time be the talk of the castle, and was in mortal terror of Lord Morven. All the domestics feared him. It would be hard to say precisely why. It came in part of seeing him so seldom that he had almost come to represent the ghost some said lived in the invisible room and haunted the castle. It was the easier for Eppie to go home that her grandmother needed her, and that her grandfather would not be able to say much to her. She was an affectionate girl, and yet her grandfather's condition roused in her no indignation, for the love of being loved is such a blinding thing that the greatest injustice from the dearest to the next dearest will by some natures be readily tolerated. God help us, we are a mean set, and meanest the man who is ablest to justify himself. Mrs. Brooks, having prepared a heavy basket of good things for Eppie to carry home to her grandmother, and made it the heavier for the sake of punishing her with the weight of it, set out with her, saying to herself, "'The jade wants a wean harder work nor I hold until her hand, and doubtless it's preparing for her.' 
she was kindly received, without a word of reproach, by her grandmother. The sufferer, forgetful of, or forgiving, her words of rejection in the garden, smiled when she came near his bedside, and she turned away to conceal the tears she could not repress. She loved her grandparents, and she loved the young lord, and she could not get the two loves to dwell together peaceably in her mind. A common difficulty with our weak, easily divided, hardly united natures. Frangible, friable, readily distorted. It needs no less than God himself, not only to unite us to one another, but to make a whole of the ill-fitting, roughly disjointed portions of our individual beings. Tearfully, but diligently, she set about her duties, and not only the heart, but the limbs and joints of her grandmother were relieved by her presence. While doubtless she herself found some refuge from anxious thought in the service she rendered, what she saw as her probable future I cannot say. One hour her confidence in her lover's faithfulness would be complete. The next it would be dashed with huge blots of uncertainty. But her grandmother rejoiced over her as out of harm's way. End of chapter 36《Chapter Thirty Seven of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirty Seven Lord Forgu and Lady Arctura. At the castle, Things fell into their old routine. Nothing had been arranged between Lord Forgue and Eppy, and he seemed content that it should be so. Mrs. Brooks told him that she had gone home. He made neither remark nor inquiry, manifesting no interest. It would be well his father should not see it necessary to push things farther. He did not want to turn out of the castle. Without means, what was he to do? The marriage could not be today or tomorrow, and in the meantime he could see Eppy perhaps more easily than at the castle. He would contrive. He was sorry he had hurt the old fellow, but he could not help it. He would get in the way. Things would have been much worse if he had not got first to his father. He would wait a bit and see what would turn up. For the tutor fellow, he must not quarrel with him downright. No good would come of that. In the end he would have his way, and that in spite of them all. But what he really wanted he did not know. He only knew, or imagined, that he was over head and ears in love with the girl. What was to come of it all was in the clouds. He had said he meant to marry her, but to that statement he had been driven, more than he knew, by the desire to escape the contempt of the tutor he scorned, and he rejoiced that he had at least discomfited him. He knew that if he did marry Eppy, or anyone else of whom his father did not approve, he had nothing to look for but absolute poverty, for he knew no way to earn money. He was therefore unprepared to defy him immediately, whatever he might do by and by. He said to himself sometimes that he was as willing as any man to work for his wife if only he knew how. But when he said so, had he always a clear vision of Eppy as the wife in prospect? Alas, it would take years to make him able to earn even a woman's wages. It would be a fine thing for a lord to labor like a common man for the support of a child of the people for whom he had sacrificed everything— but where was the possibility? When thoughts like these grew too many for him, Forger wished he had never seen the girl. His heart would immediately reproach him. Immediately he would comfort his conscience, with the reflection that to wish he had never seen her was a very different thing from wishing to act as if he had. He loafed about in her neighborhood as much as he dared, haunted the house itself in the twilight, and at night even ventured sometimes to creep up the stair. But for some time he never even saw her, for days Eppy never went out of doors except into the garden. Though she had not spoken of it, Arctura had had more than a suspicion that something was going on between her cousin and the pretty maid, for the little window of her sitting-room partially overlooked a certain retired spot favoured of the lovers. And after Eppy left the house, Davy, though he did not associate the facts, noted that she was more cheerful than before. But there was no enlargement of intercourse between her and Forgu. They knew it was the wish of the head of the house that they should marry. But the earl had been wise enough to say nothing openly to either of them. He believed the thing would have a better chance on its own merits, and as yet they had shown no sign of drawing to each other. 
It might perhaps have been otherwise on his part had not the young lord been taken up with the pretty housemaid, though at first he had thought of nothing more than a little passing flirtation, reckoning his advantage with her by the height on which he stood in his own regard. But it was from no jealousy that Arctura was relieved by the departure of Eppie. She had never seen anything attractive in her cousin, and her religious impressions would have been enough to protect her from any drawing to him, had they not poisoned in her even the virtue of common house friendliness toward a very different man. The sense of relief she had when Eppie went lay in being delivered from the presence of something clandestine, with which she could not interfere so far as to confess knowledge of it. It had rendered her uneasy. She had felt shy and uncomfortable. Once or twice, she had been on the point of saying to Mrs. Brooks that she thought her cousin and Eppie very oddly familiar, but had failed of courage. It was no wonder, therefore, that she should be more cheerful. End of chapter 37、Chapter、Chapter Chapter For more information, Or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter thirty eight. Arctura and Sophia. About this time, her friend Miss Carmichael returned from a rather lengthened visit. But after the atonement that had taken place between her and Donald, it was with some anxiety that Lady Arctura looked forward to seeing her. She shrank from telling her what had come about through the wonderful poem, as she thought it, which had so bewitched her. She shrank, too, from showing her the verses. They were not of a kind, she was sure, to meet with recognition from her. She knew she would make game of them, and that not good humouredly like Kate, who yet confessed to some beauty in them. For herself, the poem and the study of its growth had ministered so much nourishment to certain healthy poetic seeds lying hard and dry in her bosom. That they had begun to sprout, indeed to shoot rapidly up. Donal's poem could not fail, therefore, to be to her thenceforward something sacred. A related result also was that it had made her aware of something very defective in her friend's constitution. She did not know whether in her constitution mental, moral, or spiritual. Probably it was in all three. Doubtless, thought Arctura, she knew most things better than she, and certainly had a great deal more common sense, but on the other hand, Was she not satisfied with far less than she could be satisfied with? To believe as her friend believed would not save her from insanity. She must be made on a smaller scale of necessities than herself. How was she able to love the God she said she believed in? God should at least be as beautiful as his creature could imagine him. But Miss Carmichael would say her poor earthly imagination was not to occupy itself with such a high subject. Oh, why would not God tell her something about himself? Something direct, straight from himself. Why should she only hear of him at second hand, always and always? Alas, poor girl, second hand? Five hundredth hand, rather. And she might have been all the time communing with the very God himself, manifest in his own shape, which is ours also. All the time learning that her imagination could never, not to say originate, but when presented, receive into it the unspeakable excess of his loveliness. Of his absolute devotion and tenderness to the creatures, the children of his father. In the absence of Miss Carmichael, she had thought with less oppression of many things that in her presence appeared ghastly hopeless. Now, in the prospect of her reappearance, she began to feel wicked in daring a thought of her own concerning the God that was nearer to her than her thoughts. Such an unhealthy mastery had she gained over her. What if they met Donal, and she saw her smile to him, as she always did now? One thing she was determined upon, and herein lay the pledge of her coming freedom, that she would not behave to him in the least otherwise than her wont. If she would be worthy, she must be straightforward. Donal and she had never had any further talk, much as she would have liked it, upon things poetic. As a matter of supposed duty, where she had got the idea, I do not know, certainly not from Miss Carmichael, seeing she approved of little poetry but that of Young, Cowper, Pollock, and James Montgomery. She had been reading The Paradise Lost, and wished much to speak of it to Donal, but had not the courage. When Miss Carmichael came, she at once perceived a difference in her, and it set her thinking. She was not one to do or say anything without thinking over it first. 
she had such a thorough confidence in her judgment, and such a pleasure in exercising it, that she almost always rejected an impulse. Judgment was on the throne, feeling under the footstool. There was something in Arctura's carriage which reminded her of the only time when she had stood upon her rank with her. This was once she made a remark disparaging a favorite dog. For the animals, Arctura could brave even her spiritual nightmare. They were not under the wrath and curse like men and women, therefore might be defended. She had on that occasion shown so much offense that Miss Carmichael saw, if she was to keep her influence over her, she must avoid rousing the phantom of rank in defense of prejudice. She was now, therefore, careful, said next to nothing, but watched her keenly, and not the less slyly that she looked her straight in the face. There is an effort to see into the soul of others that is essentially treacherous. Wherever, friendship being the ostensible bond, inquiry outruns regard, it is treachery. An endeavor to grasp more than the friend would knowingly give. They went for a little walk in the grounds. As they returned, they met Donal going out with Davy. Arctura and Donal passed with a bow and a friendly smile. Davy stopped and spoke to the ladies, then bounded after his friend. "'Have you attended the scripture lesson regularly?' asked Miss Carmichael. "'Yes, I have been absent only once, I think, since you left,' replied Arctura. "'Good, my dear. You have not been leaving your lamb to the wolf.' "'I begin to doubt if he be a wolf.' "'Ah! Does he wear his sheepskin so well?' "'Are you sure he is not plotting to devour sheep and shepherd together?' said Miss Carmichael, with an open glance of search. "'Don't you think,' suggested Arctura, "'when you are not able to say anything, it would be better not to be present? Your silence looks like agreement.' "'But you can always protest. You can assert he is all wrong. You can say you do not in the least agree with him.' "'But what if you are not sure that you do not agree with him?' "'I thought as much,' said Miss Carmichael to herself." I might have foreseen this. Here she spoke. If you are not sure you do agree, you can say, I can't say I agree with you. It is always safer to admit little than much. I do not quite follow you, but speaking of little and much, I am sure I want a great deal more than I know yet to save me. I have never yet heard what seems enough. Is that to say God has not done his part? No, it is only to say that I hope he has done more than I have yet heard. "'More than send his son to die for your sins. "'More than you say that means. "'You have but to believe Christ did so. "'I don't know that he died for my sins. "'He died for the sins of the whole world. "'Then I must be saved. "'Yes, if you believe that he made atonement for your sins. "'Then I cannot be saved except I believe that I shall be saved, "'and I cannot believe I shall be saved until I know I shall be saved. "'You are caviling, Arctura.' "'Ah, this is what you have been learning of Mr. Grant. "'I ought not to have gone away.' "'Nothing of the sort,' said Arctura, drawing herself up a little. "'I am sorry if I have said anything wrong, "'but really I can get hold of nothing. "'I feel sometimes as if I should go out of my mind. "'Arctura, I have done my best for you. "'If you think you have found a better teacher, "'no warning, I fear, will any longer avail. "'If I did think I had found a better teacher, "'no warning certainly would. "'I am only afraid I have not.' "'but of one thing I am sure, "'that the things Mr. Grant teaches "'are much more to be desired than "'by the unsanctified heart, no doubt,' "'said Sophia. "'The unsanctified heart,' rejoined Arctura, "'astonished at her own boldness, "'and the sense of power and freedom "'growing in her as she spoke, "'surely needs God as much as the sanctified. "'But can the heart be altogether unsanctified "'that desires to find God so beautiful and good "'that it can worship Him "'with its whole power of love and adoration?' Or is God less beautiful and good than that? We ought to worship God whatever he is. But could we love him with all our hearts, if he were not altogether lovable? He might not be the less to be worshipped, though he seemed so to us. We must worship his justice as much as his love, his power as much as his justice. Arctura returned no answer. The words had fallen on her heart like an iceberg. She was not, however, so utterly overwhelmed by them as she would have been some time before. She thought with herself, I will ask Mr. Grant. I am sure he does not think like that. Worship power as much as love? I begin to think she does not understand what she is talking about. If I were to make a creature needing all my love to make life endurable to him, and then not be kind enough to him, should I not be cruel? Would I not be to blame? Can God be God and do anything conceivably to blame? 
"'Anything that is not altogether beautiful? "'She tells me we cannot judge what it would be right for God to do "'by what it would be right for us to do. "'If what seems right to me is not right to God, "'I must wrong my conscience and be a sinner in order to serve Him. "'Then my conscience is not the voice of God in me. "'How then am I made in His image? "'What does it mean? "'Ah, but that image has been defaced by the fall. "'So I cannot tell a bit what God is like? "'Then how am I to love Him?' I never can love him. I am very miserable. I am not God's child. Thus, long after Miss Carmichael had taken a coldly sorrowful farewell of her, Arctura went round and round the old mill-horse rack of her self-questioning. God was not to be trusted in until she had done something she could not do, upon which he would take her into his favor, and then she could trust him. What a God to give all her heart to, to long for, to dream of being at home with, then she compared Miss Carmichael and Donal Grant, and thought whether Donal might not be as likely to be right as she. Oh, where was assurance? Where was certainty about anything? How was she ever to know? What if the thing she came to know for certain should be a God she could not love? The next day was Sunday. Davy and his tutor overtook her going home from church. It came as of itself to her lips, and she said, Mr. Grant, how are we to know what God is like? Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Thus answered Donal, without a word of his own, and though the three walked side by side, it was ten minutes before another was spoken. Then at last said Arctura, "'If I could but see Christ. "'It is not necessary to see him to know what he is like. "'You can read what those who knew him said he was like. "'That is the first step to understanding him, which is the true seeing. "'The second is doing what he tells you. "'When you understand him, there is your God.'" From that day Arctura's search took a new departure. It is strange how often one may hear a thing, yet never have really heard it. The heart can hear only what it is capable of hearing. Therefore, the times of this ignorance God winked at. But alas for him who will not hear what he is capable of hearing. His failure to get word or even sight of Epi, together with some uneasiness at the condition in which her grandfather continued, induced Lord Forgue to accept the invitation, which his father had taken pains to have sent him, to spend three weeks or a month with a relative in the north of England. He would gladly have sent a message to Eppie before he went, but had no one he could trust with it. Davy was too much under the influence of his tutor. So he departed without sign, and Eppie soon imagined he had deserted her. For a time her tears flowed yet more freely, but by and by she began to feel something of relief in having the matter settled, for she could not see how they were ever to be married. She would have been content to love him always, she said to herself, were there no prospect of marriage, or even were there no marriage in question. But would he continue to care for her love? She did not think she could expect that. So with many tears she gave him up, or thought she did. He had loved her, and that was a grand thing. There was much that was good, and something that was wise in the girl, notwithstanding her folly and allowing such a lover. The temptation was great. Even if his attentions were in their nature but transient, they were sweet while they passed. I doubt if her love was of the deepest she had to give, but who can tell? A woman will love where a man can see nothing lovely. So long as she is able still to love, she is never quite to be pitied. But when the reaction comes? So the dull days went by. But for Lady Arctura a great hope had begun to dawn. The hope, namely, that the world was in the hand, yea, in the heart, of one whom she herself might one day see, in her inmost soul, and with clearest eyes to be love itself. Not a love she could not care for, but the very heart, generating center, embracing circumference and crown of all loves. Donal prayed to God for Lady Arctura, and waited. Her hour was not yet come, but was coming. Everyone that is ready the Father brings to Jesus. The disciple is not greater than his master, and must not think to hasten the hour, or lead one who is not yet taught of God. He must not be miserable about another, as if God had forgotten him. 
Strange helpers of God we shall be if, thinking to do his work, we act as if he were neglecting it. To wait for God, believing it his one design to redeem his creatures, ready to put the hand to the moment his hour strikes, is the faith fit for a fellow worker with him. End of chapter 38